This is Popping the Bubble with hosts Sandra Ponce de Leon and Pete A. Turner. My name is Chris Duggan. I'm a Silicon Valley entrepreneur, advisor, and startup expert, and you are listening to Popping the Bubble. Hey, Chris. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Your background and resume is super impressive. You're a serial entrepreneur, uh, multiple-time founder of Badgeville and Better Works, and an investor in many companies. And in fact, our, our paths have sort of almost even crossed a little bit because uh, we spent some time together, or not together, uh, at, a, at a company called Social Text back in the day. So really great to have you here. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about your entrepreneurial journey and what you are doing these days. I know you're advising a lot of startups and founders. Yeah, my journey, I would say, is uh, I've worked for about a dozen startups in Silicon Valley over the last 19 years. And some have been super successful and have gone on to be you know, very, very large companies um, like Palantir and WebEx and others. And then um, some have been uh, huge failures, and I've learned a lot from those experiences. And uh, over the last seven or eight years, I've actually um, done my own uh, startups that have gone on to raise uh, venture funding, and in all, have raised about a hundred million dollars in capital wow. uh, from uh, top-tier venture firms here in Silicon Valley. And now I'm off to starting a new company that I've been working on for the last four or five months. Um, so. Uh, lots of learnings, lots of successes, lots of failures, and uh, I'm still at it. When you, so you um, ran a company called Better Work for a while. Actually, I did a lot of uh, work with you guys. I actually built that tree that's in the office. Oh, really? Yeah, I yeah. love the tree. Yeah, yeah, that tree was awesome. Um, and, and it was impressive watching. By the way, guys. the tree, just so the, for the listeners, is a, it's, a, it's a goal tree. And as you check into your goals and make progress, you keep your fruit uh, healthy and alive and and looking good. And then if you don't check into your goals, you know, your, your tree loses its fruit, it starts to wither. <laughs> and it looks like, yeah, ultimately, it looks like a kind of a desert. And yeah. so you built a, a kind of a physical manifestation of that tree in our office. Yeah. And instead of fruit on the tree, we had all of the employees photos, uh, which I thought was a really cool, cool uh, symbol for the office. Yeah. And it's always such a neat thing whenever I see like a, a highlight of the company, the, the tree is a focal point. And before that, it was pictures up a stairway and I watched you guys grow. So, so not only, yes, like, are you a serial entrepreneur, but I've watched you go out and get those clients and I've pasted the things on the wall with the <laughs> client names and I'm like, oh my God, we're running out of room. You know, <laughs> yeah. you guys moved three times while I did a lot of little odd jobs for you guys. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. We went through a very high growth period and uh, it was very exciting. <laughs> oh, well, uh, now that you're um, in, in the state of advising startups and entrepreneurs, I'd, I'd love to hear um, maybe one of the pieces, the best pieces of advice that you heard along your entrepreneurial journey. Yeah. So, um, and, and just to kind of expand on, on what I, what, what you're talking about there. So I, I at my blog, chrisduggan.com and my first name is spelled with a K. So it's K R I S Duggan, D U G G A N.com. I, I put a blog up a few months ago saying, Hey, if you are, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're a startup CEO and you're looking for just a sounding board, another set of eyes, some help, um, let me know. And I'll set up a 45 minute call. If you want to talk about fundraising, you know, I've, I've, as I mentioned, you know, I've raised about $100 million in capital. If you want to talk about go-to-market and sales, um, I've interviewed over a thousand salespeople, and so I can talk. We can talk about that. And I've met with about half of the Fortune 500, um, and so I can, I can, you know, give, you know, help to folks that are going through those struggles. And my goal, I set a personal goal for myself to do 100 meetings this year. Yeah, that's incredible. And wow. I've almost done like 50 of them now. Um, that's and amazing. And, you know, I, one of the things that I try to share with folks is whether it's fundraising, go to market, sales, marketing, enterprise sales, which I think are kind of my topics of expertise. Um, and only because I've just you know, spent the last 20 years working on that. Um, I, you know, I think uh, entrepreneurs, uh, you know, the, um, a challenge that they face is, you know, should I go spend my time getting customers? Should I go and validate my idea with investors? And they spend a lot of time working on their, their deck and their investor pitch, and they are going around and meeting investor, investor, investor. And you know, my, my advice to entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurs is spend that time with customers. Yeah. Mm. And don't actually worry about your investor pitch. Don't worry about your investor deck. Worry about your customer deck. And, you know, and the best part about it is as, as you start signing a few customers, and that's the, number, that's the most important validation that you can get for your business is uh, will people pay for your product? As you start getting those customers on board, 
guess what happens? The investors start calling you. Yeah. They start mm-hmm. hearing about, wow, I heard there's a really cool product. The customers are, are raving about it. And now they're, they're, you're getting inbound phone calls. And so the, the summary there is if you spend all your time getting customers, you actually end up getting investors because of your customer traction. If you spend all your time going after investors, you get neither investment dollars nor <laughs> customers. So, okay, it's easy to say go and get customers. And it, you know, how do you stand? There are so many startups to provide so many services mm-hmm. to all of the, not the same companies, but you know, it, it, it's a pool. And you're playing in it. How, do you, how does, how does a, a new startup venture that's going to do you know, service X, how do they stand out when they go to Microsoft or IBM or Union Pacific or any company? How do, how do they do that? Yeah, and, and maybe the short answer is maybe the companies that you just mentioned are too big to go after initially. You know, it's more likely that if you're solving a, a specific pain point for a company and you have value to offer in the form of some software, it might be easier to go to a small company and talk to them about that or a mid-sized company. And, you know, there's, there's tens of thousands of mid-sized companies in the U.S. that are targets for offering a valuable service where they're going to pay a reasonable fee. I, I, you know, clearly as companies mature, as you start to, you know, build out the sophistication of your product, you can start to go and do more elephant hunting in, in the larger accounts. But I'm not sure that that's necessarily the first step that you want to, you know, kind of go after. Same kind of principle then. So when you have a house full of medium and smaller clients, the bigger clients are easy to bring in because you've proven that you can perform. Yeah, I mean, I think you are, um, you're more sophisticated with your product. You understand, you probably, you've built out more of your sales process. Right. You, you might have, and I'm not saying always start small. I'm just saying you don't have to go after the large accounts. You know, selling a Boeing is going to be a very difficult challenge versus selling, you know, um, SurveyMonkey, a, a marketing, a new marketing tool that you might want to bring to the market. Right. And, you know, the SurveyMonkeys are going to give really quick validation on like, is this something that they would buy? How much would they pay? You know, are they willing to give it a try? They're probably open to, you know, getting started with you. A Boeing is going to be a much more traditional, you know, process. And you, and again, you're ultimately, you know, I think, and it really depends on what kind of your business. Are you in a kind of a, a long tail business? Are you going after, you know, uh, is your value proposition the most, you know, kind of unlocked when you go and deliver it to enterprises? You have to figure that out. I'm, I, I, the point I'm trying to make is, you don't have to start with the biggest companies to, um, you know, start to validate your business idea. And probably going after the big companies is going to delay your ability to learn quickly. Yeah, that's a really good point. I actually, it's it's funny that we're having this conversation because I just moderated a panel last week on landing your first enterprise client with um, the Canadian Women's Network and a bunch of really uh, kick-ass female founders. And one of the things that was brought up was, you know, all of the considerations that you need to take into account when you're going after those larger accounts, um, like a Fortune 500. So um, really interesting that you point that out. I mean, what are some of the other things that startups need to consider when they're uh, transitioning possibly from market into Fortune 500? How, what other kinds of advice would you give a startup founder that is mature enough to have a product in market, some success in the mid-market, and now wants to move up the chain? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, part of this is just experimentation. So, you know, the best way to, to start to experiment is to identify 10 or 20 accounts. What are the accounts that would be really amazing wins for the company, right? Like a Starbucks or a Boeing or, you know, and, and, and hopefully there's ways to, you know, interact with those accounts in a way that's going to give you some kind of advantage. Like they're, they're also going to the same trade shows that you're going to, conferences, or they're speaking at events that you're going to, or they have a receptiveness to the idea, or they're kind of, they buy into the philosophy that you're mm-hmm. trying to communicate. And so if you can locate those people, those kind of change, change agents, those people that are thought leaders, if you can make connections with them, if they're passionate about the space, let's say you're kind of, you sell an AI type of product and Starbucks, uh, they invite the like head of people operations to some event and they talk about how they're using AI to kind of, you know, help drive faster recruiting processes or whatnot, then that's a great opportunity for a conversation about, you know, let me tell you kind of what we're working on and, you know, are there ways to potentially work together? Um, mm-hmm. So I think there, there's, you're still looking for ways to kind of get in. Um, and, you know, but I'm sure that those, those comp- there's people at those companies that care about the topics that you're, you're addressing. 
You, one of the things you focused on in your blog when you talk about like your service right now, this period when you want to help these founders, is you do want to focus on female and other like, non-white dude founders, basically, mm -hmm. which is a, a great thing. So the, the, the optimist in Pete is like, yeah, of course, you know, these women have a chance to do it. But, but the practical Pete, the practical advocate is like, yeah, but there are barriers there that you can identify and get them around potentially. Mm -hmm. But then again, you're not a woman, mm -hmm. you know, so how do you, how do you map that? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I mean, I guess I would say that the challenges that entrepreneurs face, I don't think are, are, um, you know, always, you know, gender oriented. It okay. could be just experience, you right. know, experience. And this is a first time CEO. And I guess the way I look at it is if you have a first time CEO and I've, I've done it a few times and I've made a ton of mistakes, how can I just pass on some wisdom to reduce their risk of failure or just accelerate their, their path to success? Sure. And I can think of a, 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 I just spoke with a really fantastic healthcare CEO a few weeks ago and uh, she has an amazing product. Um, she has a great team, how they're going about figuring out their pricing, I think was, was suboptimal. Mm. And and so we spent the 45 minutes just talking about better ways to really understand the pricing and packaging options for the company, and and I think um, it, it it provided a lot of clarity around a path forward that I think maybe wasn't as obvious prior to the call, and so I, I just look at it as you know what are ways to accelerate somebody's success in a way that um, kind of eliminates them having to make all the mis same mistakes that I made. That's so great. That's actually so generous of you to be having all of these conversations with. Uh, new founders and startups. Um, I guess my question to you, since you've been around for a while, would be, ha have there, is there any changes that you're seeing in terms of the market and in terms of the questions and challenges that new founders are facing today versus, you know, maybe 10 years ago? Well, I think the good news is that I, it feels like to me that, and, and I don't know the, 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 the data to back it up necessarily, but anecdotally, it feels like there's a ton more startups yeah. And yeah. there's a more understanding of like the fundamentals of what's required to be successful. And I think mm -hmm. that's a lot to do due to like Hacker News. Yeah. Like, I read Hacker News every day. Yeah. And uh, just the, the topics and conversations that are on there about not just related to engineering practices, but business practices, you know, scaling, you know, and then just all the blogs that are out there now, whether it's like Andreessen blogs or just, the, you know, just the, the volume of material that's out there for founders around understanding the metrics about how you measure success and the, 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 the roadmap and how do you think about your plan. So I, it feels like that's all, all good. But at the same time, you know, like, you know, the experience that comes with having done it a few times, having made the mistakes yourself, you know, it could be hiring mistakes. Yeah. It could be, you know, like a lack of focus. It could be trying to do too many things. It could be not being, um, you know, I think that's a, that's a, a, just one example there. I talked with another CEO recently where they were trying to do too many segments. We want to do a small business. We want to do mid market. We want to do enterprise. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my sense, you know, and this was a 50 person company, you know, it's like, how can we do all segments? Obviously we, we aspire to do all sure. segments. And ultimately, in five years from now, we can imagine that we are we have a business that is serving all of those different markets, international, domestic, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But if the company's success right now is just based on hitting a very select number of milestones to show and demonstrate enough value and enough growth that it can go out and do in the next financing, well, let's just make sure that we're really laser focused on what we need to do to kind of allow that to happen. I don't know. Those are the kinds of things that, that people want to talk about when, when, we, when we do our sessions. It sounds like, okay, so we know based upon what you've done, you've got a, a program that works. You know, you have a feel for what needs to be next. But how do you teach yourself or what are you learning from these new CEOs? What, how are you growing uh, in, in terms of your entrepreneurial abilities? So I would say one thing that's interesting is even in the act of giving advice, it's a learning opportunity for yeah. the advice giver. Because mm -hmm. I think, first of all, giving advice is pretty easy. Everybody can tell you, oh, you should go and do this. You should go and do yes, that. Yes. <laughs> but one thing I try to do is when, when, I'm, when I'm going through this process, I, I try to reflect on, am I following my own advice? Yeah, right. And that's a really good benchmark for me to kind of say like, oh, we sh we, let's revisit that topic. Or I know I thought about that, but let's make sure we're really doing something about it within my own company. So that's number one. And then number two is just by talking with really smart people, 
about their challenges creates like learning opportunities and, and things for me to think about or reflect on yeah. that I n- otherwise would not have even considered. Um, and so, yeah, I, for me, I always get I, here. And I, I would even ex- apply this to hiring and interviewing. I, even if I don't intend to hire somebody, I try to learn something from that interview every time I have an interview with somebody. And I'm looking for like some insight, something that they are bringing to the table that, you know, around how, what's that their unique approach or how they think about things or, or successes that they've had or mistakes that they've avoided, you know, or that they've had that I can avoid. Sure. And I try to take that away from every interview that I do. So I, I guess kind of following in on that, what, what's a, a mistake that you, that you made that you would advise other startup founders to avoid? <laughs> I mean, I think I've made them, I've made them all. I've all made all right. of the yeah. mistakes. Um, <laughs> all the mistakes. You know, I would say that, um, you know, I think that, uh, I mean, there's just, uh, there's a ton of mistakes. I would say, you know, some of the, probably the big learnings for me. So here, here's an interesting thing, a couple, a couple of observations around hiring. So in, in, in Badgeville, I, we raised like $40 million and uh, we were really innovating in this area of gamification and customer loyalty and engagement. And my, the, this was my first time as a real CEO. And I thought the best way to build a leadership team was to hire the most senior people in each functional area of the business. So the most senior sales leader, the most senior marketing leader, the most senior business development, most senior for customer success, and you know, and 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 CFO, et cetera. And so I we I, I spent like I, I, a lot of time. I probably for each position I interviewed 50 candidates. Wow. And you know we used headhunters and we had a whole process and. And so I spent all my time just interviewing, 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 and I was looking for people that were the, the most senior, most capable, you know, kinds of, of uh, kind of characteristics. And, w- and then as I, as I had assembled the team and we started working together, what I found was that while they were very experienced, they didn't necessarily work well with one another. Sure. Because yeah. they all were very opinionated about the way you should do things, and they were less collaborative than, than I think they should, they, they should have been. Interesting. And I also think that I, I played a role in maybe not kind of if I had been a, a more seasoned leader myself, I probably could have encouraged them to be more kind of cross functional. Mm-hmm. But I think at the end of the day, the profile was they were like somewhat political, very experienced, and they could manage kind of their area, but it couldn't work very well with others. And and so then they kind of like fast forward now to better works. Hey everyone, this is Sandra from Popping the Bubble, and we're coming to you from The Vault in San Francisco. What's The Vault? Well, thank you for asking, Pete. The Vault is a full-stack innovation ecosystem and collaborative workspace. Full-stack innovation ecosystem, collaborative work, that sounds super techy. Well, you're right there, Pete. Full-stack means that in addition to being a great place to collaborate and network for startups, The Vault has a full suite of startup advisory services, such as fundraising help, legal, IP, and marketing services. Let's also mention how The Vault works with corporations through Viz, The Vault Innovation Services, and VIA, which is The Vault Innovation Academy, which also offers courses in developing innovation at scale. The Vault celebrates innovators from around the world and provides entrepreneurs with the right tools and support to grow better and faster. This segment of Popping the Bubble is brought to you by The Vault. Thanks to Kevin and his team for all the amazing work they do to fuel innovation in Silicon Valley and across the globe. Very experienced, and they could manage kind of their area, but it couldn't work very well with others. And and so then they kind of like fast forward now to BetterWorks. So my experience with BetterWorks was, I you know, I'm going to do the opposite of that. Yes. I'm only going to hire up and comers. Yeah. <laughs> and so I spent, and I like my marketing leader, an amazing up and comer. My product leader, amazing up and comer. And, and so what I learned from the up and comers was they are making first time mistakes all the time uh-huh. because they're learning. <laughs> right. and, but they work extremely well with one another because yeah. they're very open and collaborative and, and, you know, and kind of they, they, um, they can do that. And so, you know, I guess my takeaway would be, you know, so like for my next company, you don't want all just experienced people and you don't want all just up and comers. You probably want a mix of some experienced people and some up and comers. 
nice. um, but it took me like three times to figure that out. <laughs> and who knows if that's even the recipe, right? right exactly. <laughs> Maybe it's going to be the in-between diamonds in the rough, <laughs> you know, the forgotten, the forgotten man or woman. That's funny. Uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit about, well, sir, first let me say, we're talking to Chris Duggan. You can find out about his blog on chrisduggan.com. He talks about how he's helping 100 entrepreneurs in 2018. And there's, you've done a, a zillion things. What's, entrepreneurs always have more things to do than, than they have time to do. You mm-hmm. know, like I talk about, like my, I have a bandwidth of this much time and I've got to decide what I'm going to put in there. And there's things I would love to do, but they're just outside of what I'm capable of doing. What's outside of that? Like F1 formula, one race car driver mm-hmm. or what's, cause you could do a lot of things. What do you just like? I just can't do that. So, so the question is kind of what are things that I wish that I had time to do that I can't get to? Right. Yeah, exactly. Projects, entrepreneurial yeah. things. You know, I mean, I guess um, one thing that I've been thinking about lately is investing my time in some type of nonprofit mm-hmm. um, area. And, you know, without going into all the details about it, you know, really kind of looking at what are segments of the public sector that could be, I don't know, kind of, you know, better performing if we made data available mm. and it could even be on like, like and and I haven't even settled on an area where, where necessarily I would, I would point this concept, but as an example, like we, we, we've read a lot in the press recently about um, injustice that happens in certain court rulings and are judges biased or not biased. Yeah. And, you know, and so I started thinking about, well, what are ways that data could, if we could actually understand that judge's record, and we could compare that judge to other judges and understand their consistency of rulings. Could that performance data sure. basically be, make make injustice more transparent? Like an ELO rating for counties. And, like for, it could be, for, and you could apply that to oh like sheriff's departments, yeah. so county and, and judges. So, And I don't know if legal is the area where you know, I, I don't know how accessible that data is. But I guess like thinking about how can data make create insights and and potentially eliminate injustice and so i get really pa- I'm, I'm passionate about that i'm passionate about performance data i'm passionate about transparency sure and so and 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 so those concepts applied to government processes seem to be interesting but it's it's something that i i'm not really able to take on right now and and so if there's somebody that's really passionate about that that wants to partner up uh, you know, maybe that's something that I would consider, but that's kind of something that I see on the horizon for yeah. something that I might want to get involved with. Yeah, and I think that um, it's it's interesting that you mentioned the concept of transparency and data, but that kind of leads into the conversation around blockchain, which is really all about you know promising uh, this you know decentralized platform for you know uh, the truth essentially. So have you explored blockchain at all? Is it some is it a topic that you're interested in? So you know, I, I guess I would say that I don't. I don't know enough in the area. I mean, I've I've done some research. I've been to a couple of Bitcoin conferences. Mm-hmm. Um, I hold Bitcoin. Nice. All right. Uh, Good job. But um, and I I think there are some potentially interesting applications around healthcare and blockchain. Mm-hmm. Um, but but haven't really really kind of done enough exploration to to feel confident in that area. Well, you've had all these amazing uh, conversations with fifty founders. You have fifty more. So what what's next after this for you? So, uh, you know, so the coaching thing is really just to give back. People, people always, they ping me and they're like, so how does it really work? You know, is this, yeah. you know, are you going to, is this a consulting gig? So the coaching is totally free. It's, it's, it's entirely just for me to give back. And I try to do, you know, anywhere from two to five conversations a week right now. And they're only for the 45 minutes things. And, and once I get to a hundred, I mean, I'm going to want to continue it in some capacity, but it's it is it is obviously very time consuming to do. Sure. Um, I I I also spend time with um, Alchemist Accelerator and okay. and um, it's a fantastic accelerator. Uh, it's actually the, the number one rated B two B accelerator. Oh really? Uh, huh. And um, the the head oh. of the organization, Ravi Balani, he's an amazing guy. They've had a lot of successes. Um, so I, I help out there, and then I, I've also been looking at other ways around. Um, uh, potentially doing some you know, some entrepreneurial kind of volunteering and coaching as, as well, but my my primary passion right now is actually launching my new startup, and I've been working on that for four or five months. Um, I, I'm not really prepared to kind of talk too much about it today, sure. other than it's a health tech uh, company, and um, and we're trying to do some pretty unique problem solving in the healthcare space, 
in a way that hasn't really been done before and we think is really novel and 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 so I'm applying all the things that I'm you know giving advice on I'm trying to apply to my yeah. own startup and um and so uh, we'll see how it goes but I'm I'm feeling right now I'm feeling really bullish about it. Cool. Ooh. Well, we can't wait to learn more about your new startup. Hmm. I think we'll have to have you on again for that to talk about that once you're That'd ready to launch. Yeah, um, so yeah, thank you very much. I'll make sure that the uh, the the blog is in the show notes, and we'll do a nice little write up for you. Anything else you want to cover that we didn't get to? No, I think I think we covered a lot. Hey, Chris, thank you so much. It was so yeah, great really to cool. meet you virtually. Um, would definitely love to connect in person at some point in the future. I think that there's some uh, interesting overlap with some of the things that I'm working on as well. So um, would love to just, you know, uh, continue the conversation. So thank you so much. Yes, likewise. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for this opportunity. I really, uh, it was fun. And yeah, I'd love to do another one maybe down the road when, when it, yeah. whenever we, uh, we maybe for the launch or, you know, whatever might make sense, but like a part two, maybe. Part two. Yeah, <laughs> definitely.